Modern society is perverse, not in spite of its puritanism or as if from a backlash provoked by its hypocrisy. It is in fact and directly perverse. In this episode of Philosophers Explained, we turn to Michel Foucault and his 1976 A History of Sexuality, Volume 1, in which the postmodern philosopher critiques modern philosophy and modern culture, particularly with respect to its views and actions on sexuality. Let's go to the text. The History of Sexuality, this is from volume one of a projected four-volume series by Michel Foucault, this first uh, volume published in 1976. Now, it's a history of sexuality, and partly what Foucault wants to do is take up the stories we tell ourselves, not only about sex, but sexuality and the regimes within which these operate. And there's one story that modern liberal capitalists like to tell about sexuality, that in the bad old days, we were repressed, we were oppressed. There were all of these restrictions. But as we became modern, liberal, and more capitalistic, we became freer with respect to sexuality. Partly, it was just general liberal attitudes that said we should be making our own choices about sexuality, whom we're going to marry and uh, have relationships with and so forth, and not be so strict about uh, proper sexual roles. And perhaps also part of the story has to do with capitalism and the Industrial Revolution. We became richer, so women in particular, for example, had more control over their finances and so had greater degrees of uh, sexual freedom. And there were inventions of technologies, birth control, uh, condoms, mass-produced birth control, pills that women could take and thereby control their sexuality. And all of this is a good news story that modern liberal capitalism tells. Now, Foucault starts by saying there is another story, though, that we can tell. And for that, let's start to read. For a long time, the story goes, we supported a Victorian regime, <clears throat> and we continue to be dominated by it even today. So Victoria here is uh, Queen Victoria of, the, uh, of Britain, and uh, uh, notably uh, uh, prudish and puritanish with respect to sexual mores. And the idea here is that this became emblematic and symbolic of uh, uh, modern society to the extent that it was influenced by the British, which of course was, was, uh, was hugely so. And the contrast then is to say at the beginning of the 17th century, a certain frankness was still common, it would seem. Skipping down a little bit, codes regard, regulating the coarse, the obscene, and the indecent were quite lax compared to those of the 19th century. It was a time of direct gestures, shameless discourse, and open transgressions when anatomies were shown and in intermingled at will, and knowing children hung about the amidst or amid the laughter of adults. It was a period when bodies, quote, unquote, made a display of themselves. So what we have then in the pre-modern area is more openness, more freedom, more, more expression with respect to sexual mores. But then we find by the time we get to the 19th century, the Victorian era, that has gone away. But twilight soon fell upon this bright day, followed by the monotonous nights of the Victorian bourgeoisie. On the subject of sex, silence became the rule. The legitimate and procreative couple laid down the law. And then some of the further prohibitions that went <clears throat> as part of the package was children were asexual, they have no sex, and so all discussion by children or about children with respect to sexuality is subject to repression and even penal law. And then Foucault goes on to say, well, of course, everybody kind of secretly knows that there's all this other sexuality that's going on underneath the surface of so-called Victorian mores. And so there's a hypocrisy there. Such was the hypocrisy of our bourgeois societies with its halting logic. So by the time, though, we get to the early 20th century, uh, there's perhaps some opening that starts to be made here. Perhaps some progress was made by uh, 
Freud. Sigmund Freud, with his idea that we are creatures of strong instinct, including a strong sexual instinct, and that if we repress this uh, 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 too much, uh, which we typically do in, in Victorian society or modern society more broadly, then it comes out in the form of various neuroses or even psychoses. So perhaps we need to relax things a little bit. So maybe Freud is opening the way to a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, salvation on, uh, on this score. Now, Foucault then comments, okay, this discourse on modern sexual repression, which is to say, before the modern era, in pre-modern times, things were more open, but modernity has been characterized by increasing sexual repression and oppression, uh, holds up well, he wants to say. By placing it at the, or, or sorry, let me start that again. By placing the advent of the age of repression in the 17th century, after hundreds of years of open spaces and free expression, one adjusts it to coincide with the development of capitalism. So sexual attitudes, uh, which might not necessarily seem to be something to do with capitalism, but nonetheless, we have a coincidence here. Capitalism starts to develop, and then this more repressive approach to sexuality, as this story would have it, starts to develop at the same time here. Could this be more than just a coincidence? And Foucault wants to say, well, this story says, no, it's not a coincidence. At a time when labor capacity was being systematically exploited, how could this capacity be allowed to dissipate itself in pleasurable pursuits, except in those reduced to a minimum that enabled it to reproduce itself? So what we then have here is the Marxist story, or with some adjustments and variations, a neo-Marxist story. And the story then says, really, it's economic forces that are at the base here. What does capitalism want to do according to the Marxist story? Well, it wants to control everybody. It wants to control the laborers, organize them, make them do work. And then, of course, it wants to do that so it can capture as much of the, the energy and the profits from that energy and keep them for themselves. So uh, it makes sense then that this capitalist profit motive would extend to all other areas of life. And so it would also want to control people's leisure time, including their sexuality time, so that uh, you know their sexuality is not interfering with their capacity to do work that can be exploited economically. And then also if we uh, uh, you know, say everybody has to have sex only uh, with married couples and in the bedroom for procreative purposes, then we're also not only controlling it, but we're also then generating the next generation of laborers whom we can exploit as well. So we have a story here that makes sense from the Marxist perspective. But Freud, uh, sorry, and now Foucault wants to say, I don't think that this is the story that is quite correct either. So he indicates a break with standard Marxism or uh, the later neo-Marxism. But it appears to me that the essential thing is not this economic factor, but rather the existence in our era of a discourse in which sex, and I want to pause there, Edison is to say, the important thing is going to be not so much the economic forces, but the discourse forces, how we are talking about things, how we are thinking about things, the whole language that we are constructing in the modern world, and uh, uh, on general Foucauldian uh, 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 analysis, this is a, uh, a knowledge, or a knowledge in, uh, uh, in quotation mark, or one of many knowledges, and knowledge is a form of power, or knowledge is power, We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But it's this discourse about sexuality, not the economic factor that's going to be more important. Now, he agrees we live in a repressive modern society. So that good news liberal story is false. This is because repression is so firmly anchored right, in modern society. All the longer, no doubt, as it is in the nature of power, particularly the kind of power that operates in our society to be repressive. We don't live in a liberal, free society. We live in a deeply repressive society. And that's uh, then, then, then a fundamental. But it's not fundamentally going to be economic repression, as the classical Marxists will say. It's a repression that uses discourses of a certain sort for its tools of repression. 
I do not maintain that the prohibition of sex is a ruse, but it is a ruse to make prohibition into the basic and constitutive element from which one would be able to write the history of what has been said concerning sex starting from the modern epoch. So how we are going to control sexuality first requires a certain discourse be created. And within that discourse, then there's going to be, of course, some repressions and prohibitions that go on. But it's the nature of the discourse that's more fundamental. All these negative elements, defenses, censorships, denials, which the repressive hypothesis groups together together in one great central mechanism to deny sex, say no, are doubtless only component parts that have a local and tactical role to play. So we need a bigger picture, a more strategic understanding of how this to talk about sex is going on in the modern world. A transformation into discourse, a technology of power, and a will to knowledge that are far from being reducible to the former. So it's not just those local censorships and controls. There's something bigger at work here. This is the essential thing, right? repeating that phrase. This is the essential thing that Western man has been drawn for three centuries, that's to say during the modern era, to the task of telling everything concerning his sex. A censorship of sex, there was installed rather an apparatus for producing an ever greater quantity of discourse about sex, capable of functioning and taking effect in its very economy. All right, so it's not that we are putting sex as the Victorian hypothesis we're now in the closet uh, or just not talking about it or just denying it. Uh, instead, Foucault is suggesting that, in fact, we are talking a whole lot more about it uh, in various ways. That's the important thing and that the, uh, the repressions and censorships and so on are only a small part of the overall tale. So an example of this, uh, and he goes to the year 1867 to a small village in France. One day in 1867, a farmhand from the village of Lapcor, who was somewhat simple-minded, employed here and there, depending on the season, living hand and mouth to mouth, rather, from a little charity or in exchange for the worst sort of labor, etc., etc. So we have a poor rural farmhand working various jobs in, uh, in, uh, in villages. And then this is what happened. At the border of a field, he had obtained a few caresses from a little girl. So he had some sort of a sexual encounter, a grown man with a little girl, just as he had done before and seen done by the village urchins around him. For at the edge of the wood or in the ditch by the road leading to St. Nicholas, they would play the familiar game called curdled milk. All right, now pausing here, we are putting ourselves in the countryside. Uh, so we have to, uh, to, 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 to grasp this metaphor, I'd put it to somewhat delicately. We think of a cow, and we know that cows produce milk, and how cows produce milk is, uh, 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 has to be uh, involve the farmer or the milkmaid uh, grasping the teats and then jerking the teats in various ways, and then the milk comes streaming out. And of course, if milk uh, is left sitting out for a while, it takes on this curdled appearance. So we take that metaphor. Or that's what's going on with the farmhand and the little girl. So what, what was the reaction now? He was pointed out by the girl's parents to the mayor of the village, reported by the mayor to the gendarmes, led by the gendarmes to the judge who indicted him and turned him over first to a doctor, then to two other experts who not only wrote their report, but also had it published. What is the significant thing about this story? The pettiness of it all. The fact that this everyday occurrence in the life of village sexuality, these inconsequential bucolic pleasures could become from a certain time the object not only of a collective intolerance, but of a judicial action, a medical intervention, a careful clinical examination, and an entire theoretical elaboration. 
So back in the olden days, before modernity got its hands on sexuality, this sort of thing would happen, and it was no big deal, right? It was, it's, it's, it's a petty, everyday occurrence, but now in the modern world, we make a big deal about it. We talk about it a lot. We bring in the police. We bring in the judges. We bring in the doctors. We bring in the scientists, and we produce all of this language and discourse as a way of controlling it in a certain way direction. So we're going from relaxed openness to control and repression. That's the significance of this story. Now, Foucault goes on to uh, say just a few more things. This village halfwit, you know, the farmhand who received the cresses, uh, you know, he said he would give the pennies to the little girls for favors. The older ones refused him. So apparently older girls or younger women wanted to, you know, nothing to do with him sexually. So he's paying little girls to do so. But this is petty uh, uh, from the Foucauldian analysis, but it's not petty from the modern repressive controlling uh, way of talking about sexuality and thinking about it. And where we are now then is through the various discourses, legal sanctions against minor perversions were multiplied. Sexual irregularity was annexed to mental illness. From childhood to old age, a norm of sexual development was defined, and all the possible deviations were carefully described. Pedagogical controls and medical treatments were organized around the least fantasies, moralists, but especially doctors, brandished the whole emphatic vocabulary of abomination. So what we then are doing is we're saying we're trying to control sex in all various ways from, uh, from, from children all the way into old age. Now we are studying it. We are analyzing it. We are making taxonomical schemes. We are medicalizing it. We are turning it over to the judicial and the penal system. We're building this entire apparatus of power to control and define sexuality in contrast to the earlier freer era. This medicalization of the sexually peculiar was both the effect and the instrument of this. And this, Foucault wants to say, is the perversity of modern society. Modern society is perverse. Right? This is a total reversal. Right? It's not that back in the olden days, the perverts could get away with all sorts of stuff. And uh, uh, now we are trying to control the perverts. We have a distinction between healthy sexuality and unhealthy sexuality. Instead, that is the very, uh, that's a cover rather for the deep perversity of modern society itself that it's trying to do those things. Modern society is perverse, not in spite of its puritanism or as if from a backlash provoked by its hypocrisy. It is in actual fact and directly perverse. So implication then is that we have to uh, um, um, reject both of the earlier stories. We must therefore abandon the hypothesis that modern industrial societies ushered in an age of increased sexual repression, right? So it's not either the good news liberal story about sexual freedom and liberation in the modern world. It's not the Marxist story. Rather, uh, it is this story. The opposite has become apparent. Never have there existed more centers of power, never more attention manifested and verbalized, never more circular contacts and linkages, never more sites where the intensity of pleasures and the persistency of power catch hold of sexuality. We are not repressing sexuality. We are talking about sexuality. We're analyzing sexuality. We're bringing huge uh, uh, industries, uh, huge institutions of society to bear upon sexuality. That's not repression at all. That's the opposite of repression. So this is now Foucault speaking in his own voice. Let us put forward a general working hypothesis. The society that emerged in the 19th century, bourgeois, capitalist, or industrial society, call it what you will, did not confront sex with a fundamental refusal of recognition. On the contrary, it put into operation an entire machinery for producing true discourses concerning it. Not only did it speak of sex and compel everyone to do so, 
it also set out to formulate the uniform truth of sex. So there is a truth about sex. We are going to define what that truth is, is, and it's going to be uniform, the same sex for everyone. And we are going to then to build up this entire set of socially institutionalized apparatuses of power to further and maintain that way of thinking and talking about sex. As if it was essential that this sex be inscribed not only in an economy of pleasure, but in an ordered system of knowledge. Right? So there's the modern approach to knowledge, and we need to incorporate sex into that overall ordered understanding of what knowledge is. So what we, then uh, Foucault again speaking for himself here, shall attempt to constitute the political economy of a will to knowledge. So what we have then is this idea that somehow there is a will that wants to manifest itself in various ways. And here uh, Foucault is uh, uh, somewhat Nietzschean in his metaphysics. We'll see that shortly more explicitly, that uh, the fundamental uh, nature of reality is, uh, uh, is will, and that will has an agenda. In this case, the will, uh, uh, this form that the will is taking is a will to knowledge, and that will to knowledge wants to incorporate everything into its particular way of understanding everything, including sexuality. So when we're talking about the will to knowledge and making a transition now to this Nietzschean will to power theme in the next section, Foucault turns to the concept of power. The word power is apt to lead to a number of misunderstandings, misunderstandings with respect to its nature, its form, and its unity. So notice how many uh, versions of power Foucault rejects before he gets to his proper understanding of power. By power, I do not mean power as a group of institutions and mechanisms that ensure the subservience of the citizens of a given state. So it's not a political top-down understanding of power. That's not what uh, I, I, Foucault, am talking about. By power, I do not mean either a mode of subjugation which, in contrast to violence, has the form of a rule. It's not that either. Finally, I do not have in mind a general system of domination exerted by one group over another, a system whose effects through successive deviations pervade the entire social body. So it's not that we have some people who have power and they use that power uh, on, on behalf of their own interests, on behalf of their own agendas over other people. That's not also the correct way to think about power. Instead, what is power? Power is the moving substrate of force relations, which by virtue of their inequality constantly engender states of power but the latter are always local and unstable. And this is an important point where the metaphysics uh, that Foucault is bringing to bear is fundamental. Rather than seeing that we are individuals, right, or we are groups of individuals, we are collectives or we are institutions uh, that are what we are and that we have power or we possess power or that we use power on behalf of our interests and agendas, it is the other way around. That is to say, it's not that we use power, it's rather power uses us. To note Foucault's language here, it is the substrate, it is the fundamental. So metaphysically underlying everything is power or force relations doing their thing. And it's moving, right? It's changing, it is evolving out of the various conflicts that it is engendered. And it engenders states of power, and the latter are always local and unstable. What that then is that we are a state of power. It throws up what we might call individuals or constellations of individuals for various purposes and so forth. And some of those power centers are more powerful. Some of them are less powerful. So they are in conflict with each other and domination relationships are happening and so forth. But it is power that is the fundamental and everything else is derived from 
uh, and, and a byproduct of or instantiations of underlying power. So he goes on then to say at the end of this paragraph, power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it comes from everywhere. So what this means then for sexuality in the modern world and its particular power agenda that comes out in the form of a knowledge that prioritizes uh, scientific understanding as various sorts of legal systems and structures and so forth, uh, that particular form that power is taking then brings with it a certain agenda with respect to sexuality. It wants to say, our form of sexuality is the proper form of sexuality. It is the true form of sexuality. It is the healthy form of sexuality. Any sort of you know, positive normative concept here. And then everything else that does not meet that is wrong. It is immoral. It is a perversion. And so it then becomes very concerned with differentiating itself from all sorts of perversions. Right. Consider, for example, the history of what was once the great sin against nature. And so here we're talking about homosexuality. The extreme discretion of the text dealing with sodomy, that utterly confused category, and the nearly universal reticence in talking about it made possible a twofold operation. So homosexuality then increasingly comes to be an object of interest, of concern, and then uh, 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 control and repression. But then also pederasty. So uh, as we saw before, child sexuality was much more free and open and normal. Now it has come to be seen as either non-existent or something not to be talked about. And then people who want to engage with it are now perverts to be talked about and controlled in certain ways. And then in this next interesting phrase, the psychic hermaphrodism, another perversion uh, that according to modernity needs to be talked about, categorized and dealt with in, uh, in various negative ways as well. But interesting that it's psychic hermaphrodism. So we're not talking about biologically, we can't make a differentiation uh, in the genitalia, say, between uh, male and female in the case of a particular individual. The point is, whatever the biological uh, genitalia are there, it might be uh, normally easy to identify it as male or female. It's psychic hermaphrodism. The person does not psychically identify or feel himself or herself to be male or female. So there's a mismatch between the psychic uh, uh, sexuality and the what we normally call the biological sexuality. But of course, using the word normally here now inside the modern framework, and that will be question as well. So there isn't, on the one side, a discourse of power and opposite to it, another discourse that runs counter to it. So it's not to say that we are saying, well, you know, there's power, and then those who of us who are against uh, power, we want to be free. Instead, everything is power. It's just colliding uh, uh, forms of power or discourses about power. And then uh, uh, the idea of one of those discourses, particularly the modern discourse, that when we are talking, we need to be scientific, we need to be logical, we need to be uh, consistent and non-contradictory in our talk about all sorts of things. Foucault wants to argue that is just one discourse's internal power agenda, that it wants a certain sort of discourse. Instead, Foucault goes on to point out that discourses themselves are tactical elements or blocks operating in the field of force relations. So words, language, discourses are themselves just tools of power. And those various centers of power are in conflict with each other. And so they are weapons that we use in the conflict. It's not that one really is true and non-contradictory and objective in any given sense. So he goes on then to say there can exist different and even contradictory discourses within the same strategy. They can, on the contrary, circulate without changing their form from one strategy to another opposing strategy. So here's Foucault as a postmodernist saying logical consistency does not 
matter. Avoiding contradiction does not matter. That principle itself is just one way of discoursing, trying to impose its power agenda on other ways of using language, which are you know, equally legitimate. One of the essential traits of Western societies is that the forced relationship, which for a long time had found expression in war, in every form of warfare, gradually became invested in the order of political <clears throat> Power. And so the point here is that uh, what has happened then in modern society is that warfare, which used to be one element uh, uh, and that the rest of society was supposed to be not at war, rather the language of war, the methods of war come to suffuse all aspects of society. We want to control, we want to dominate, uh, we want to force into submission all of the other discourses, all of the other lifestyles, we might say, in order to have hegemony over them. So it's everything really is just war by another name in modern society. So with this analysis, then, we can say <clears throat> this deployment does not operate in symmetrical fashion with respect to the social classes, and consequently, it does not produce the same effects in them. That is to say, the modern scientific legalized discourse about sexuality is the product of one kind of power play. Uh, it operates on behalf of a particular group, but it does not have the same effects on all of the other groups. And so Foucault concludes, we must return, therefore, to formulations that have long been disparaged. We must say that there is a bourgeois sexuality and that there are class sexualities. So there are different sexualities for different groups. Uh, it's just that the one form of sexuality is trying to control all of the other ones. Now, we can then, uh, having gone through this analysis, uh, 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 undercut or reanalyzed or stripped away the mask of pretension of this one way of understanding sexuality, uh, that leads uh, uh, we can start to imagine or reimagine other forms of sexuality and other knowledge regimes, other legal slash political regimes with respect to. Uh, sexuality. Moreover, we need to consider the possibility that one day, perhaps in a different economy of bodies and pleasures, people will no longer quite understand how the ruses of sexuality and the power that sustains its organization were able to subject us to that austere monarchy of sex so that we became dedicated to the endless task of forcing its secret of exacting the truest of confessions from a shadow. So at some point, we might be in a position to be able to uh, uh, think outside of the current framework, the modern bourgeois, liberal, capitalist, so-called understanding of sexuality, uh, and then something else could possibly happen. But notice the final uh, 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 sentence here. The irony of this deployment, right, that is to say, this possibility and this way of thinking about sexuality is in having us believe that our liberation is in the balance. Foucault is making an important point that he does not believe that we are in a regime of oppression and the opposite of that is some sort of liberation of other forms of sexuality in the future. There is no such thing as liberation. Everything is power. What will happen possibly is other centers of power will arise. They will overthrow and uh, uh, perhaps come to dominate the currently dominate dominant forms of, uh, of, of sex and talking about sexuality. But that's not a liberation. That's just the arising of a different form of uh, power with a different regime with respect to sexuality. It's an ongoing non-stop uh, power struggle uh, in all domains, in this case, focused on sexuality.